guy pretty like a girl And he got five stories to tell I see both sides like Chanel See on both sides like Chanel Swimming laps through pool water Eating like I'm underworld Had my tattoos in Shibuya Police think I'm of the underworld Twelve treat a nigga like he twelve How you looking up to me and talking down? Can't you see I am the big man? God level, I am the I am I film it with the drone cam in the pink like killer cam. Yeah. Zoom on that stick, no way. I'm so close, I'm on that kill. Controller on your lower back, yeah, that's the good. Dick will roll the eyes back in the skull. Hi, my name is Margaret Haley. I live in New York City. I've been here for 26 years. And uh, I've had several jobs while I'm in New York. And I finally retired and at 65 and when I retired I was called by a company to come and help them out which the company's name is Aon and they are in the World Trade Center on the 101st floor. So September 11th I woke up in the morning I was very happy and I uh, headed for work uh, about 6.30 in the morning uh, got off of the bus near the World Trade Center. The sky was beautiful blue. It was a beautiful, beautiful day and I uh, had no idea what was to come that day because everything started out so beautifully. Went up to my office on the 101st floor. Uh, I hadn't even changed into my heel, my high heels. I kept my sneakers on uh, because most of the people didn't even come into the office till about 8 o'clock and I always got there. I was one of the first ones there to open the doors. So so now it's about, you know, it's a little bit after 8 o'clock and uh, so I'm settled in. Uh, everything looks good and uh, there were people that came in and stood at my desk and start talking to me before office hours and uh, we were just standing there talking at uh, 845, around 845 there was an enormous, enormous explosion that actually shook the towers. The lights all dimmed and uh, I turned to the engineer that was standing at my desk and I said, that is not a normal explosion. He says, I'm going to go to the back and see maybe a transformer or something blew up. We didn't know what happened. So he turns, he goes to the back. My boss, Lorraine Lee, was standing at my desk and uh, she had just divulged her secret. She looked beautiful, she looked radiant, she was all dressed up, she, her, she was just glowing and she told me, she said, Maggie, I have a secret I have to tell you and she said, you know, I bit quit smoking, I went on a diet and I'm going to be in vitro this week, we want to have a baby. Then she went and I congratulated her. She went back to her desk, and uh, this was right before the explosion. Okay, when the explosion hit, she said, "Oh, I got to go back to my desk. I have to go back and and wait for instructions." So there were two other women, a young girl, Patricia, that ran out, and she was frightened, and she ran out to my desk, and she won. She said, "What's going on?" And about that time. This Virginia come running down the hall and the explosion she could see from her side of the building, which was the north side, and she felt the heat from the fire. And she come running down the building and at that point I thought, I said to Patricia, I said, let's just get the hell out of here. I grabbed her, started running to the elevator and one of my bosses tried to stop me and she said, you can't take the elevators, you have to go down the stairs. They said, when there's an emergency, don't take the elevators. Well, at this time, there's a loudspeaker came on. And on the loudspeaker, they said, there's something going on in the North Tower, but I want everybody to stay at their desks. Do not move until we give you further instructions. And I said, not me. And so, about that time, the elevator doors opened on the 101st floor, and I just rushed in the elevator with the girl, Patricia, that was with me, and now the boss that was trying to tell me not to take the elevator, she came in with me too. So we went, and then you have to go down to the 92nd floor and transfer elevators. 
because the elevators didn't go from 110 to the ground floor, you had to transfer. And there was a little mezzanine there. And as we got to that floor, everybody was kind of panicking at this. There was a lot of people and they were all kind of panicking and moving all over. And so now Leonora, the boss, again says to me, you cannot go further in the elevators. Let's try to find a stairwell. We didn't know where the stairwell was. We never were instructed. So about that time, we had really enormous elevators on that floor. They, they would hold like 30 people and there were 10 of them. And so I just went over to the elevator and I says, you know what? I'm taking my chances on the elevator. So I rush into the elevator. Now all this crowd that is panicked and not knowing what to do followed me. They all wanted to get in the elevator. So there was a big guy that worked on my floor that was with me. He got in the elevator. And it was so crowded that the elevators wouldn't move. So we had to... Uh, push people out of the elevator. And we kept pushing them out until the elevator would move. And I'm sure a lot of these people didn't live, but that's part of the guilt thing. But So anyway, then the elevator starts to move and everybody's crying and they're all on the elevator and I'm trying to tell them to stay calm and we get we get down to the ground floor and they wouldn't let us go out the doors where the World Trade Center was because there was too much debris falling through the air. There were fire and suitcases and all kinds of stuff coming out. And so we had to run. There was a big mall there, so we had to run through the mall to try to find a way out of the building. As we were all running through the mall, now this whole crowd is escalating, becoming like running really fast like a stampede and as this was happening another explosion went off by in the mall somewhere this is kind of a mystery nobody really knew about what happened at that point but it, this explosion just accelerated the crowd people women were falling being trampled on and so it was you know either flight or, or you perish so I, uh, I'll never forget this one lady that I went over and she was a heavy set black lady and she, she fell really hard and she slid and I stepped over her and her face stays with me always because she looked up like help me but if I would have I would have went down too so I just kept running and running over her and getting out the door finally. As I got out the door, I was out about 10 feet on Liberty Street on the south side of the building and I looked up and there's an enormous plane coming towards our building and I thought, what the heck is this guy flying so low for? Because we didn't know that there was a, a, a plane that went into the other building. We had no idea what was going on there. So anyway, I looked up and I thought, that's really strange. I went a little bit further and I went, I looked down on the ground and there was like these um, flight um, boarding passes and stuff and it had names on them and whatever and I grabbed it and some other girl grabbed it away from me and I said we got to turn this in but she was like, she's, she just took it but I, that was part of the plane that crashed into the other building. But anyway, as I looked up, I went a little ways, turned around, and watched the plane go into my building. I was right underneath it, and uh, that was at, uh, we had like 14 minutes from the first plane hitting to the second plane hitting, so it was like minutes that I got out of there when the second plane hit. And so, anyway, I start, I, I guess I must have been in shock because I was kind of standing there staring at this building and it was on fire at the top and I have pictures of all the smoke and stuff in the, and the, uh, the way the building started to burn and there's, I have a lot of those so okay as I was running a little ways out of the building I realized I had a camera in my pocket that I had taken to work I wanted to finish taking all the pictures so I pulled out my camera and I turned around and started taking pictures of the building as it's starting to burn. And this are some of them. 
and I just stood there and kept taking pictures of the building. This is upside down, like this. And as I was, as I was doing this, taking pictures, a lady policeman came up to me, and she says, "I want you to run as fast as you can down that street," because she said she knew the building was ready to implode. So I just, I start running and I ran and then all of a sudden I look over my shoulder and the building is imploding, it's coming down. Beautiful, I mean it was perfect. It didn't, went, it went this way a little bit and then it just like imploded like this. One, one flight after another, it just was like, I was like, whoa. It was so perfect how it came down. It came down first, my building came down first, was hit second but came down first. And uh, so all of a sudden this whole um, avalanche of debris and smoke and building and everything was coming after me. So I was running like hell and I was running like crazy and I just tried to, I kept ahead of it as much as I could. And so finally I found a, on Cedar Street, which is by Wall Street, I found a, a rotating door and I ran down, ran down this rotating door. This was when I got caught up in the debris. This is what it looked like when I went got caught up in the debris and it just came and covered all of us. So I went, I went down through the rotating door. I ran and I had enough good sense to see a stairwell there. So what I did is I ran down the stairwell in this building. When I and as as I go in, into the building, all of the debris hit the glass. It just went crashing into the glass and all. And so I'm downstairs, and I see this woman who was hysterical running. She was bleeding. She had stuff all over her. She couldn't see. Her eyes were caked with all this stuff. And she was hysterical and running around, so I ran over to her and I grabbed her and pulled her to the floor and tried. And then this other young man from the radio shack, he was he came down then and he was covered with debris and all, but he had a water bottle with him. So him and I tried to dig the stuff out of her eyes so she could see. And uh, so as we were doing that, the guard comes down and he said, you need to get out of this building. They're going to hit our building because we were in the stop market district and they thought they were going to hit the stock market and so he said you got to get out of here it was as we were starting to leave this other Ju lady Judy her name was came down there and she her, she had her feet all bleeding she was caked with all this and she needed help so me and Robert the little guy from the radio shack we both grabbed hold of him and because one had a hurt back and she could not walk so we grabbed hold of him and pulled him took him up the stairs and and then we started trying to walk and everything there was debris just inches thick all over everywhere it was everywhere so I had enough good sense to know I couldn't breathe that stuff so I had a little top on like a t-shirt top and I took some of the water and I wet it and pulled it up over my head so I could breathe and so then we started to walk and Kim, my daughter, she had an apartment in Soho, which was maybe about a mile away. And she was in Paris, but I had her keys. So I decided I would walk over to her, take these ladies to her house. And, and then the young man went with me too. So we carried them. And we went through Chinatown. And as we're going through Chinatown, all the Chinese were like looking at us like we were zombies walking down the street. And, None of my kids knew I was even alive at that point. And I was trying to find some kind of phone service. Nothing worked because the tower went down. And so I finally get into Chinatown and uh, I was begging these people, let me call my son, let me call somebody, let, let my kids know that I'm alive, right? So this one Chinese lady finally said, okay, you come in to just this far, because we were all covered with soot and everything. So they didn't want us to get it in the restaurants. So I went in there and she gave me a quarter and I called my son and said I'm alive. That was like two or three hours later. So he, all that time, everybody thought I perished with the buildings. So anyway, they they had taken 
these little Chinese, they were kind of funny. When I went out, all of my, the two ladies were sitting on the curb with, the, with Robert, and they lined up glasses of water for us to drink out on the curb. So then we walked on further down. We couldn't get an ambulance, you couldn't get it, because all the ambulances, all the fire department, all the cops, everybody were going into the building when we left. And so uh, I got to my daughter's house, and the neighbors were standing out there, and so they all, there were young guys that lived in the building. They were running and getting Band-Aids and running and help, trying to help us. And then Mike finally got through to Kim's phone, and he called, and he said, I just heard on the news that you got to get that stuff off your body because it's very toxic, all the stuff that was on our body. So all of the neighbors were there, and they were so sweet. These one guy, I'm really good friends with him still. He was like getting everything for us and helping us out and getting medicine and all. And then I just went over to Judy and I just tore all her clothes off her, turned on the shower. And I stood in there because she couldn't stand because she hurt her back really bad and she couldn't see. So I start showering them down and I'd stand in the shower with each one of them. And we were naked in there and these young guys were helping us out. And so I went through all my daughter's drawers and I got clothes for them. and. Uh, Put them, and then uh, Mike, Michael finally borrowed his boss's car and came over and picked up the one lady that was really in bad shape because we couldn't get an ambulance. So he took her to a hospital. And then the other lady, her husband lived in Brooklyn, so he took, he walked across the Brooklyn Bridge all the way over there on foot to come and get his wife. We're still good friends. She calls me her angel, so she's she's okay now. They're very, the other lady was really traumatized. I don't think she is doing very well at all because we never heard more about her. The young man that was helping me didn't even realize he had a broken ankle, but he, you just forget about that because when you have this adrenaline rush, you don't think about nothing. It's just the adrenaline rush is incredible. And uh, so I was under an adrenaline rush for few days until I got to a doctor. But anyway, so we get to her house and they picked up the, and then Emily and Alex were in high school. They were dismissed from school. They came to the house and there was like soot all over and in the apartment was a real mess. So Alex and Emily start cleaning up and trying to comfort us and whatever. And then we heard that we had to get out of that area because all the air was really bad up to 14th Street. So then we start walking to my house, Emily and me and Alex. And we start walking and it was the most incredible thing. The whole city was like, like a haunted city. It was like dark. No businesses were open, no buses running, no way to get a cab, nothing. There were no way to get water, nothing. Everything shut down everything. So we finally walked all the way over here and uh, they stayed with me and uh, the, ne the next day I was like, I, I guess I was still in shock because I went back down to, to the heap the next day. I didn't even know I went that far down there because the only way that I know that is I was interviewed on a TV station and my friend saw me. But I was looking for my associates, anybody. I was looking for people. Didn't even know I was doing that. And then they finally got me up to um, the armory up on Lexington, where they brought all the people, the survivors, and the people looking for loved ones and all. And uh, so the minute I walked in the door, this nurse runs over to me, and she, she knew I was like kind of crazy or out of my head. She ran over to me, and she said, you were there, weren't you? And I said, yeah. And she says, come with me. So she took me to a doctor right away. And I physically did not have a scratch on me. I just had a lot of like soot and stuff, but I was smart enough to protect my head with, I did everything right. I did everything right. I mean, when I was running, I was running this way, jumping over this. I mean, it seemed like, and I know for a fact today that somebody guided me out of that place because I'm a real big believer in my, I have an Indian guide, I'm a real big believer in him, and I felt like I was being guided out of that place. In fact, 
after about three days later, another friend of mine called and said, because I was on an adrenaline rush, I'd get up in the morning and I'd go looking. And I was like crazy. I'd go to libraries, they had names of people that survived, and I'd go to the library, got to fight with the lady because I grabbed, tried to grab the book away from her because I wanted to see it so bad, that who survived. And so then it, my friend finally got me to a really high-powered doctor, and he told me what to do to come off of that adrenaline rush. Because you, if you stay on adrenaline rush for any length of time, you could have a heart attack or get really sick. So. So then my son, the next weekend, he picked me up and he took me to the emergency room up by Chappaqua and they did all these exams. They gave me antibiotics and all that stuff for that. But at that time I was interviewed a lot by different newspapers and I was interviewed by a Detroit paper. And um, I don't even remember what I said to him. And uh, the next year he called me and he said, can I do a follow-up story on you? And I said, yeah, what did I tell you the first time? And he said, I'll send you the, I'll send you the newspaper. And you know what I said at the end? I was running like an Indian. My words were, I'm running like an Indian, not even though. And then I thought a lot about that later. And I know that somebody was telling me the right things and guiding me or I wouldn't be here because we lost 176 people. Many of them were my friends and people I worked with. Many of them young fathers with little children, mothers with little children, and then I survived. When I go to a lot of the memorial services because they know that I worked on the same floor, they'd say to me, well, how come you survived? How come you got out? And where was Lorraine? Where was, uh, where was uh, Phil? Where was everywhere I went? Ed's funeral and all these. And, but it was really hard at that time because I don't know, you know, who knows why I survived? And all of these young people with families didn't, you know? So I had to go through a lot of that survivor guilt and, uh, I end up doing a lot of counseling for people that were in the Trade Center. In fact, a therapist from uh, Chicago uh, asked me why I wasn't a therapist because I'd go into the meetings and what I would say to them would really, really help them a lot. So maybe that's the reason, you know, that I was older. I was much older than most of the people that lost loved ones. And um, so, you know, after that, I did go back down there a few times. I have a lot of stuff in the museum that they took. And I have a, I'm in this book, Faces of Ground Zero. These are all the survivors and the, all the firemen, the policemen, the, the ones that made it out. They all have their own stories to tell. And uh, I don't know where my picture is in here somewhere. Anyway, it's in here. This is an article in Pueblo, Colorado, but anyway, it's, you know, you wonder why somebody survives and somebody doesn't, but I don't have an answer for that. And uh, it took me a long time, you know, to come to terms with it, but I th think now, you know, about the people that survived, a lot of them, they could never, not, never found their bodies, and uh, they'll never have any kind of closure, which is pretty sad. But I do what I, you know, I do what I can. I donated a lot of stuff to the museum, and uh, I have a lot of stuff in the 9-11 Museum, and um, that's about it. <laughs>